Welcome, everybody. Um, so nice to see uh, some familiar names listed in the uh, participant section. It's also nice to see some uh, some uh, new names as well. So welcome to the Institute of the Humanities webinar uh, lecture um, by our uh, uh, guest of honor, Kathy Kilo, um, who will be speaking on a matter of love and death, Marcuse and Adorno on narcissism. We also have two um, uh, commentators uh, on Kathy's paper, um, whom I'll introduce uh, very uh, shortly. Before I go any further, my name is Samir Gandesha, and I'm the director of the Institute for the Humanities here at Simon Fraser University. I'm also a professor in the Department of Humanities. And I'd just like to acknowledge uh, respectfully that we are, um, as a university, um, situated on the unceded territories uh, of the Coast Salish people, the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. Um, and this event tonight is um, uh, particularly uh, uh, special for us because it, uh, it is um, uh, an event in which we have uh, all three speakers who uh, were um, uh, visitors at the Institute uh, last semester. Uh, and this really marked for us a kind of coming out of at least a certain phase of the pandemic where we were sort of getting back into um, kind of in-person uh, engagement, in-person teaching, in-person um, events. And it was a truly uh, a wonderful time that we uh, we had to uh, spend together when uh, I think uh, all too quickly as these things uh, tend to do. Um, and so um, this is a kind of a way of, in a sense, keeping um, uh, you know that, the, the, those feelings and 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 that spirit of discussion and engagement alive. Um, so, uh, with without any um, further ado, oh well, actually, with a bit of further ado, I should say before we um, before I get on to introducing um, Kathy uh, and and, uh, and Roberto and Rogelio. Uh, I'd just like to first thank, um, uh, as always, Huyen Pham uh, for her efforts in um, uh, helping to put together events such as this. Uh, she's a communications uh, person in the Department of Humanities and still works very much with the Institute. Uh, Wallace Hartley uh, and, uh, and Devin Gillen, who uh, has done so much work for us as uh, our videographer, uh, archivist. Um, being able to uh, record these events and, and make them available in in the future uh, to general public um, is uh, especially important. I mean, we are a you know a kind of public facing unit in in the university, and so it's really uh, important that we have the the kind of archives to be able to, um, in a sense, you know, represent the kinds of things that we've we've been doing and and. We'll continue to do it in, in the future. So thanks very much, Devin. Uh, kind of unsung hero around the, the Institute. Uh, we really appreciate your uh, your efforts. So let me just now introduce um, uh, Kathy. And then once she's uh, um, presented her, her paper, I'll introduce our uh, two uh, commentators. Uh, Kathy will be speaking for about, uh, about 45 minutes, and then we'll have uh, two 10-minute comments. Uh, uh, commentaries on, on her paper. Um, so Kathy uh, Kilo is Associate Professor of Humanities at OCAD University in Toronto. Her past research includes work on ethics, aesthetics, and theories of embodiment in Adorno and uh, Emmanuel Levinas. Um, she's also the co-founder of the Association of Adorno Studies and the former editor of the Journal of Adorno Studies. Um, she's currently writing manuscript about love, autonomy, and solidarity in Adorno. And I'm assuming this is a, 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 a chapter of that uh, work or a draft chapter of that work. Um, so, Kathy, welcome, and uh, you, you now have the floor. Thanks, Samir. Um, before I begin, I would like to give a few thanks of my own, first of all, to Samir for your amazing hospitality and to Huyan for all of your help, not just with tonight's event, but with the practicalities of the uh, visiting fellowship that I held at uh, the Institute this last semester. Um, you know, of course, I'd also like to thank in advance Roberto and Rogelio for, um, for their attention to this text. I provided it to them in English and they very uh, generously um, uh, worked with it, even though their English is impeccable and wonderful. 
but I just want to, to, to say an extra thanks because that's an extra level of work that when I invited them to participate, I didn't really take into consideration and I want to acknowledge it. Um, I'd also like to thank my home institution, OCAD University, for granting me the sabbatical uh, time to do this research. And even though they're not here at this meeting, I'd like to thank my family and my partner for um, being so patient with me while I lived away from them for four months in Vancouver during my sabbatical. So um, without further ado, I hope I haven't forgotten to, to thank anyone else, but um, I'll begin. I want to state here at the outset of this presentation that these remarks do not make up a historical argument. No archives were consulted in the drafting of this presentation. This is a work of, I hope, rigorous speculation. I'm asking you to entertain the possibility that Herbert Marcuse's Eros and Civilization served as an inspirational precedent for Theodore Adorno's engagement with Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytical theory in the 1950s and 1960s. Of course, I don't mean to say that Adorno wasn't already thinking through Freud prior to the publication of Marcuse's book. Freud is all over the pages of Dialectic of Enlightenment and Minima Moralia, for example. My point is rather that the attention Adorno pays to Freudian drive theory sharpens in the period after the publication of Eros and Civilization in 1955. As he places greater emphasis upon narcissism as a dominant social condition, foregrounds the question of how psychic drives could be organized more rationally, and explores the aesthetic realm as a model for this reorganization, Adorno's interests come to reflect key moments of Marcuse's argument. I suggest that this demonstrates a certain affinity for Marcuse's preoccupations. Perhaps Adorno recognized an important possibility opened up by Marcuse's philosophical inquiry into Freud, a possibility that Marcuse wasn't able to articulate adequately in Eros and Civilization. I'll pursue this theory by presenting key elements of Adorno's philosophy as though they are intended as correctives to Marcuse's argument. I want to trace and to simulate what I imagine to be the sustained and iterative nature of the intellectual dialogue between them at the level of their published texts. This speculative project contributes to our understanding of the aims and the intentions of Adorno's philosophy, centering our attentions upon Adorno's transformation of Freud's drive theory. If we read Negative Dialectics of 1966 and the posthumously published Aesthetic Theory, which appeared in 1970, as in part attempts to modify Marcuse's rereading of Freud, we find that Adorno's reinterpretation of Freudian drive theory identifies and addresses social needs, needs that still resonate with us now, and that Marcuse himself seemed unaware of when he wrote Eros and Civilization. This is nowhere more apparent than in part one of Negative Dialectics, The Ontological Need, and in the opening section of Aesthetic Theory, Art, Society, Aesthetics. Adorno argues in Negative Dialectics that the popularity of Heideggerian ontology reveals an ontological need for absolute knowledge, knowledge that can provide reassurance in the form of solid ground of an unchanging reality I argue that this need also motivates Marcuse's turn to primary narcissism as his model for a new reality principle governing society. Adorno's own philosophy does not attempt to meet this need for absolute knowledge. Instead, it interrogates the need itself, and I argue, finds it to be shaped by a society held in thrall to the death drive, a society in which the pursuit of knowledge is inextricably linked to the will to dominate. In the first section of aesthetic theory, art, society, aesthetics, Adorno offers a theory of sublimation that combines Freud's drive theory with Kantian disinterestedness and suggests that a different kind of knowledge, one that is not instrumentalized in the service of domination, is accessed by the subject in the experience of art. He anticipates a subject in whose comportment Eros is joined with knowledge. Adorno rejects Marcuse's emphasis on hedonism and aesthetic pleasure here, focusing on the work of art's demand on the subject rather than what the subject gains in the experience of art. He writes that, quote, what the work demands from its beholder is knowledge and indeed 
knowledge that does justice to it. The work wants its truth and untruth to be grasped. Knowledge in the service of domination reduces the object to the measure of the subject. But the artwork demands that the subject attain knowledge of the object as other than, as incommensurable to the subject. Such knowledge registers both identity between subject and object, and also their distinction, the difference that separates them. The artwork then for Adorno is not a font of pleasure, but an enigma, a site of resistance to the hegemony of the subject. This resistance contains the potential for both a relation of solidarity between the subject and object and the subjective autonomy that grows out of that relation. Adorno's philosophy anticipates a subject that can renounce subjectivity as domination and enter into a relation of solidarity with the object. On my reading, it edges, it edges towards a theory of how the drives and the epistemological subject might be reconciled in the absence of repression and domination. This reconciliation is also Marcuse's goal in Eros and Civilization, but whereas Marcuse's argument is predicated upon a weakening of the ego, I argue that Adorno's philosophy instead hints at a transformation of the Freudian psychic apparatus, enlisting the ego not as an agent of repression, but as a facilitator of this reconciliation. What we need, Adorno implies, although he always seems to stop short of saying so directly, is neither a weaker nor a more masterful and self-disciplining ego, but rather an ego that is capable of navigating conflict and contradiction without being overwhelmed by fear and resorting to violence. The distinction between the two thinkers becomes apparent when we compare the way in which narcissism figures in Marcuse's Eros and Civilization and how it is treated by Adorno. Marcuse identifies primary narcissism as a potential resource for the project of building a non-repressive society. Marcuse asserts that the drives themselves are rational, that it is only in our adaptation to a rational society that we are driven to be acquisitive and destructive. We can therefore eradicate the destructive death drive by liberating ourselves from the repressive ego and the restrictive morality imposed by wrong society. But Adorno conceives of the drives otherwise. For him, they are neither inherently rational nor irrational. This is what makes the drives malleable and what allows for their reorganization in a more rational society. But it's also what necessitates the transformation of the ego beyond its dual role of the agent object of domination. Unlike Marcuse, Adorno doesn't envision the eradication of the death drive, but I argue, his philosophy opens up the possibility of a society no longer dominated by the death drive. Adorno's characterization of collective narcissism as a block on social transformation might lead us to assume that unlike Marcuse, he saw no revolutionary potential in narcissism. However, I argue that the mechanisms of secondary narcissism do inform Adorno's theories of aesthetic sublimation and aesthetic comportment. Although this remains an unacknowledged connection in Adorno's own writing that I wanna tease out. The renunciation of subjective domination that makes solidarity possible is a withdrawal from the object. In this withdrawal, immediate desire is transformed into a more restrained comportment toward the object. I argue that this process of withdrawal mimics secondary narcissism as a redirection of erotic energy from the love object to the self. So let me take a step back here to provide some context for my argument and to review the background that informs both Adorno's and Marcuse's description of the ego as weakened under the conditions of late capitalism. In making this claim, both Adorno and Marcuse draw upon the Frankfurt School studies on authority and the family that were led by Max Horkheimer in the 1930s. These investigations started with the hypothesis that the family dynamics described by Freud were specific to the bourgeoisie during the height of liberal capitalism. They theorized that the industrialization of labor and the development of mass society stripped the father of his power. Although the cultural expectations associated with patriarchal society remained in place. Without a strong father figure with him to identify, the ego's own development is hindered and the individual is forced to look outside of the family for authority figures. Under these conditions, the development of the superego is less a matter of family dynamics 
and is more dependent upon external, less personal and intimate sources, including popular media and entertainment. Standardized and repetitive, the anonymous products of the culture industry serve as substitute ego ideals. As the ego ideal becomes increasingly anonymized, the ego weakens, becoming alienated from its own desires and needs. For Adorno, this means that reality is dominated by the identity principle, which demands the conformity of all to the measure of the subject formed in relation to this anonymous ego ideal. Adorno claims that this imposes, quote, on the whole world, an obligation to become identical, to become total, end quote. The identity principle is thus synonymous with the death drive. It regulates a society that aspires to a perpetual and tensionless sameness, echoing the psychic stage of primary narcissism. Freud's concept of primary narcissism refers to the psychic stage prior to individuation, in which there is no experience of self and other, no boundary between self and environment, and in which a sense of omnipotent power prevails. His theory of the death drive suggests that it is the happy memory of the stage of primary narcissism that seduces us into acts of destruction and aggression. The death drive, as the desire to return to this stage, poses a challenge to civilization itself. It aims at the destruction of the self and others and can manifest as a withdrawal from society or as aggression against the world. Freud's first claims about the existence of a death drive were published in his essay of 1920, Beyond the Pleasure Principle. Prior to this point, he had theorized that the pleasure principle, regulating life according to the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain, was the ultimate motor behind our conscious behaviors, thoughts, and actions. The pleasure principle, according to Freud, rules the instinct-dominated id. And as the ego develops out of the id, the pleasure principle transforms into the reality principle, shaping the instincts into socially acceptable desires. Eros, or the life drives in service to the pleasure principle, aims at the creation of unities, beginning with sexual coupling and reproduction. And its conformity with the reality principle, Eros facilitates the consolidation of families and then extended communities. However, Freud's clinical experience treating traumatic neurosis in the post-war period linked via a common repetition compulsion to observations of his young grandchild at play, prompted him to speculate about a drive that ran counter to Eros, a drive that conformed to a rule arising not from the reality principle, nor even from the pleasure principle, but from somewhere beyond both of them. Freud characterizes the instincts as fundamentally conservative and beyond the pleasure principle. Quote, an instinct is an urge inherent in organic life, to restore an earlier state of things which the living entity has been obliged to abandon under the pressure of external disturbing forces. It is the expression of the inertia inherent in organic life. The earlier state of things to which the instincts wish to restore the human individual is the stage of primary narcissism, which Freud associates with maternity and early infancy. In this phase, the infant has of yet no experience of individuation. They are at one with their environment, which sees to their needs under ideal circumstances with only minimal and temporary discomforts. This lends to the subject, Freud theorizes, a feeling of happiness and an infantile sense of omnipotence. Later in Civilization and its Discontent, published in 1939, Freud introduces the notion of the oceanic feeling, a sense of oneness that he associates with religion and with a regression to primary narcissism. The death drive is conceived as an anti-ego pulse here. It desires a regression back behind individuation and the adoption of love objects, a return to the psychic stage of primary narcissism. Freud is gravely concerned about this obliteration of the moral individual. If the death drive cannot achieve the destruction of individuality, it exercises its hate, its appetite for aggression and destruction upon external objects. Eros and death drive, according to Freud, are biological impulses, which means that they are universally present and that we cannot rid ourselves of them. This discontent of humanity, according to Freud, is entirely due to the irrevocability of the death drive as an innate biological impulse. Freud theorizes that the death drive serves a social purpose and that it fuels the superego's punishment of the ego with guilt 
and this guilt ensures that the ego fulfills its function of repressing socially unacceptable drives. He is convinced that civilization cannot exist without this compounding guilt, keeping aggression and destruction in check. However, he observes that the death drive is too strong, too punitive, and too much guilt weighs heavy upon the subject, thereby made rife with pathological conditions. Although Adorno did not subscribe to Freud's pessimistic view entirely, after all, unlike Freud, Adorno understood the possibility that civilization might potentially take many forms, some of which might not be repressive, but he, neither would he have endorsed Marcuse's. This is because while Marcuse foresees a mature ego free of guilt because it exists in a non-repressive mature civilization, his description of this potential maturity relies entirely upon a regression back behind individuation. For Marcuse, maturity means a minimization of the ego. Espenhammer has noted that this is the point upon which Marcuse extends his thinking beyond the framework of the other Frankfurt School theorists who, in Hammer's words, see true happiness as inseparable from active self-determination. Conversely, when Adorno uses the term maturity, it refers to this self-determined autonomous subject. Hammer suggests that autonomy, for Adorno, would mean that the subject has acquired the capacity to mourn lost objects. This distinguishes his account of subjectivity from Marcuse's classically melancholic great refusal. I don't disagree with Hammer on this point, but I argue that the ability to move from melancholy to mourning requires both self-knowledge and an ego that actively mediates drives without being overwhelmed by them. Nonetheless, there is some agreement between Adorno and Marcuse. For example, Marcuse saw Freud's conception of the drives as an ahistorical universalization of a specific cultural configuration. Marcuse attempts to correct Freud's drive theory by infusing it with a Marxist analysis of alienated labor and class division under capitalism. According to Marcuse, quote, the repressive organization of the instincts is not inevitable or eternal because this organization is due to factors that he says quote, emerge from the specific historical conditions under which the instincts develop. That is to say that these factors do not originate in the drives themselves. The order imposed upon them increases the antagonism between the life and death, dri de life and death drives, fueling the dialectical regression of eros to death drive. This analysis is more or less similar to Adorno's perspective. But Marcuse's account departs from Adorno's when he writes approvingly of Freud's depiction of what a liberated Eros would be. He writes, quote, free Eros does not preclude lasting civilized societal relationships. It repels only the supra repressive organization of societal relationships under a principle, which is the negation of the pleasure principle. Marcuse implies here that social strife is caused by too much repression, that a reality principle that is far too opposed to the pleasure principle is to blame for the breakdown of social relationships. Although Marcuse rightly criticizes Freud's drive theory for its lack of historical specificity, Marcuse himself ends up postulating an a historical free eros as those social conditions could be swept away to reveal the life drives purified of any social residue. Adorno, on the other hand, recognizes that the drives are socially and historically mediated, but this means, first of all, that they are transformed over time and that this transformation cannot be undone. And secondly, that pure drives are a mere projection of desire for absolute knowledge, what Adorno refers to as the ontological need. Marcuse concedes that some level of repression is required in order for humans to survive and thrive but he argues that the system of patriarchal capitalism necessitates even more repression. Marcuse refers to this excess as surplus repression. This, according to Marcuse, is the crux of the issue, the source of the death drives domination over social life. He calls the reality principle that regulates this repressive society the performance principle because the subject is required to produce, quote, socially useful performances, in which the, the individual's labor is not performed in line with, quote, his own faculties and desires, but for the benefit of the impersonal and abstracted productive apparatus, 
The performance principle normalizes heteronormative romantic love as a domestication of eros and reduces libidinal pleasure to genital sexuality. Ridding ourselves of the surplus repression that patriarchal capitalism requires would mean allowing the free flow of eros within the individual and between the individual and their environment. This, according to Marcuse, would put an end to alienated labor and the restriction of enjoyment. It would make us happy. Marcuse argues that Freud's concept of primary narcissism could furnish a positive model for a new non-repressive society that it opens up, quote, another existential relation to reality and that, quote, narcissism may contain the germ of a different reality principle. Adoption of this new principle aiming towards gratification would liberate the subject from surplus repression. Under the new reality principle, the libido would be transformed from its reduction to genital sexuality into the pre-genital polymorphous sexuality characteristic of the psychic stage of primary narcissism. It would then spread over, quote, the entire personality. The result, the body as a whole becomes what Marcuse calls an instrument of pleasure and an overwhelming sense of harmony rather than conflict and domination is established between humanity and nature. But actualizing the revolutionary potential Marcuse claimed for the psychic stage of primary narcissism would be anything but liberatory on Adorno's account. This is because Adorno is particularly attuned to a fact that Marcuse seems to overlook in Eros and Civilization, that social conditions under late capitalism have transformed the character and the dynamics of narcissism as Freud first described them in detail in 1914. In his essay on narcissism from that year, Freud presents narcissism as a pathological and compensatory happy refuge from an overly repressive society. He writes there that, quote, loving in itself, in so far as it involves longing and deprivation, lowers self-regard. Whereas being loved, having one's love returned, and possessing the loved object, raises it once more. When libido is repressed, the erotic cathexis is felt as a severe depletion of the ego. The satisfaction of love is impossible, and the re-enrichment of the ego can be affected only by a withdrawal of libido from its objects. The return of the object libido to the ego and its transformation into narcissism represents, as it were, a happy love once more. And on the other hand, it is also true that a real happy love corresponds to the primal condition in which object libido and ego libido cannot be distinguished. This passage seems to support Marcuse's claim that the issue is repression rather than narcissism itself. In a less repressive society, Freud seems to imply here, there would be a more liberal circulation of love, which would heighten self-regard and strengthen the ego, making secondary narcissism a much less prevalent coping mechanism. But in the post-war period of industrial development and the global expansion of capitalism, the ego has been weakened beyond the capacity to secure this happy love of the self, in the withdrawal of libidinal energies. In the essay, Opinion Delusion Society of 1962, Adorno reiterates Freud's claim. The libidinal energies are finite, so the ego suffers a loss of love and a loss of self-regard when the subject becomes attached to an object that does not return these energies in kind. But to this, he adds an observation about the overwhelming coldness of social relations under the conditions of late capitalism. He suggests that the spread of bourgeois coldness throughout society makes our interactions with others exhausting and psychically painful. He states that, quote, human beings to this day are obliged to withhold a measure of their ability to love from, for instance, other loved ones, and instead to love themselves in a repressed, unacknowledged, and therefore insidious manner. This, Adorno argues, further weakens the ego and thereby leaves us vulnerable to collective narcissism and identification with the anonymous collective. Adorno writes that under these conditions, the individual, quote, would be exposed to an unbearable degree of narcissistic injury if it did not seek a compensatory identification with the power and the glory of the collective. Because the weak ego has only a very limited capacity to reflect upon the drives that motivate its behavior, the drives are therefore conceived as alien 
and irrational demands. Out of fear, the subject resorts to a forceful repression of the drives. In the absence of an ego that could mediate and understand them, the drives are very rarely successfully sublimated, that is, fulfilled in a manner that isn't damaging to the self and to others. This produces a subject divided from itself, embroiled in both fear and frustration because it has no knowledge of its own desires and cannot therefore satisfy them. Paralyzed by its own ignorance, the subject then readily adopts the products supplied by the culture industry as the objects of its own desire and avoids the formation of human relationships that it does not know how to sustain. Locked up inside of a reactive shell, the narcissistic individual dominated by ego alien forces is alienated not only from potential sources of warmth, love, and human connection, but even its own needs. Therefore, an excess of repression is not the only or even the most pressing problem we face. Without the capacity to engage in self-reflection, to develop critical self-knowledge, the narcissistic subject of late capitalism, driven by forces it can only perceive as foreign and threatening, is but a pseudo-subject. Prevented not only from giving or receiving love, but also from achieving autonomy, the subject seeks compensation in regression, in the sense of belonging provided by its membership in the collective. Through the glory of the collective, the individual is able to regain a sense of gratification in its domination over things in the world. It's important to note, as Fred Alford does in an article on Eros and Civilization that was published way back in 1987, that, quote, the most problematic aspect of Marcuse's argument in Eros and Civilization is its utter separation of object mastery and gratification. That is to say that Marcuse seeks to establish a reality principle that takes gratification as its aim, but he forgets that mastery is a route to gratification, to a pleasurable recovery of that lost feeling of omnipotence associated with primary narcissism. This is the same mechanism of domination and gratification that Adorno describes in association with collective narcissism. Adorno illustrates this mechanism by citing the rabid football fan who insults the visiting team and its supporters in a bid to position his own as superior regardless of how the match plays out on the field. I offer an updated image. The social media warrior engages in moral shaming of their perceived opponents, cheered on by a chorus of the like-minded without regard for the veracity or even the plausibility of their stated position. We find these dynamics at play on both the political right and left in our contemporary society. Truth suffers most greatly as unfounded and untested opinion is substituted in its place. <clears throat> Both the ego and the epistemological subject are further weakened, further compromised by the individual's identification with the collective. Drives dominate the ego and the subject's capacity for reflection and knowledge production is greatly diminished. The problem with this collective state of narcissism, from Adorno's perspective, therefore, is not that it licenses an excessive self-confidence or moral permissiveness, traditionally considered attributes of narcissistic tendencies, but that it locks subjectivity into a reactive loop, depriving the subject of its autonomy and its capacity to think critically. This renders us fundamentally unfree and blocks social change. If Adorno's observations about contemporary life are feasible, and it seems to me that they are, then a regression to primary narcissism would not free us from surplus repression. In fact, it would make a bad situation even worse than it already is. The individual, if it survives at all, would not be able to take responsibility for itself or for others. And that means that love for others is different and discreet from the subject could not be experienced or expressed. This would leave us even more susceptible to the unthinking opinion promoted by the anonymous collective, recall here my example of social media dynamics, and would enfold us even more deeply in the death drive dominated society from which both Adorno and Marcuse seek to liberate us. I want to turn briefly now to the role of aesthetic sublimation in Eros and civilization. Marcuse wants to go beyond Freud to establish a form of drive sublimation that is genuinely non-repressive. According to Freud, the ego sublimates drives by converting antisocial urges into socially productive 
practices. These practices include the creativity that results in the production of works of art. In his essay on Leonardo da Vinci, Freud suggests, for instance, that the artist funneled his sexual desires into a compulsive and productive quest for knowledge, contributing to the technological progress of humanity, albeit Freud admits in the perhaps regrettable form sometimes of designing more efficient weaponry. Speaking plainly, Freud calls sublimation the process whereby the instinct is directed, quote, towards an aim other than and remote from that of sexual satisfaction. Although Freud himself calls sublimation a way out, a way by which demands can be met without involving repression, his libido theory ends up treating sublimation as a mere subtype of repression. That is to say that sublimated impulses are only partially satisfied because their fulfillment is restricted to actions and behaviors that repressive society deems acceptable. Because he sees the ego as primarily an agent of domination and repression, Marcuse determines that non-repressive sublimation must bypass it. Citing Freud's essay, The Ego and the Id of 1923, Marcuse argues that sublimation always occurs by way of primary narcissism. That is to say that the transfer of erotic energies from one object to another or from an object to a creative process is reliant upon our access to this realm of primary narcissism in which drives are united in an undifferentiated flow. Marcuse argues that the aesthetic dimension can facilitate this liberation of the drives through the faculty of the imagination, sublimated drives contribute to potentially revolutionary visions of alternate realities. But as Marcuse explains, the realm of the aesthetic, quote, has retained this freedom from the reality principle at the price of being ineffective in reality. He explains that the constitution of the aesthetic sphere as separate from reality is a result of, quote, cultural repression, that reality cannot abide, quote, contents and truths that are inimical to the performance principle. This is the reason why art remains socially and politically ineffective. But Marcuse argues this is also why these contents can be important aspect of the rejection of the performance principle. Marcuse's great refusal, therefore, extends to a refusal of this separation of art and life. He calls for a desublimation of reason that would liberate the drives from their compromised form as socially acceptable desires. Marcuse theorizes that the drives themselves are capable of a non-repressive self-sublimation. Drawing on Freud's own observations, he argues that there is a naturally occurring self-restraint in Eros that calls for, quote, delay, detour, and arrest. In creating obstacles to gratification, the delayed release of tensions increases pleasure. If this is true, then the drives themselves obey a kind of reason. And as Marcuse has it, their own, quote, libidinal morality or a, quote, pregenital morality that is proper to the id. This means that their orientation toward gratification is achieved through a rational process of self-sublimation that, quote, proceeds in a system of expanding and enduring libidinal relations, which are in themselves work relations. Marcuse assures us in this way that the weakening of the repressive ego in the service of liberation would not result in an orgy of indiscriminate sexual pleasures, or in his words, quote, a society of sex maniacs, because Eros itself is rational and self-inhibiting. But this point doesn't anticipate Adorno's concern that the actual existence of a social condition of collective narcissism reinforces a society organized against our best interests. Non-repressive society, according to Marcuse, could be built upon non-repressive self-sublimation and pre-genital morality. He turns to the classical figures of Orpheus and Narcissus, representatives respectively of the arts of music and visuality, treating them as what he calls the cultural heroes of a reality principle in which man and nature are erotically reconciled. Marcuse argues that these classical figures have been wrongly identified with negative traits by a morality that celebrates 
the industriousness of Prometheus and conforms to the Oedipal law that regulates sexuality and individuation through domination in the name of the performance principle. This morality, Marcuse maintains, has been superimposed upon a more original meaning that the figures of Orpheus and Narcissus symbolize, life ruled by the pleasure principle as the oceanic unity between the individual and their environment that, Marcuse argues, is not solely ruled by Thanatos as Freud would have it. Marcuse claims that within a non-repressive society, liberated eros would be strengthened to the point at which it could, quote, absorb the objective of the death instinct. What this means is that rather than death, the reconciled drives would conform to the nirvana principle, aiming at a tensionless state of relaxation and life-affirming contemplation. Marcuse thus attempts to correct the conditions that produce false consciousness that prizes repressive performance over subjective gratification and fulfillment by affecting a reversal of values. In doing so, he appeals to an original, pure erotic drive unsullied by repressive force, the site of a homecoming for humanity. Recently in Critique on the Couch, Amy Allen has characterized Marcuse's attempts to reconcile the drives in Eros and civilization as a naive projection, a utopian wish fulfillment that is itself driven by the death drive. She argues that Marcuse seeks a return to a fetishized original wholeness of the subject, rooted in a violent desire to dominate the death drive itself. Although I don't agree with Allen's treatment of Adorno, in her book, I'm inclined to agree with her on this point, and I actually think that Adorno would too. Adorno's criticism of the yearning for a return to a pre-bourgeois, quote, harmony of subject and object in Georg Lukács' history and class consciousness gives us a sense of how he might have balked at Marcuse's attempt to rid us of the death drive in Eros and civilization. In Negative Dialectics, Adorno accuses Lukács of glamorizing a historical past that is not actually all that different from the present. Can we view this as a proxy argument with, Luk with Lukács standing in for Marcuse. Adorno might as well be referring to the regression of subjectivity to the stage of primary narcissism in Eros and civilization when he writes in reference to Lukács that, quote, the cult of pre-subjective phases arose in horror in the age of individual disintegration and collective regression. I propose, that Adorno would view Marcuse's call for a new reality principle grounded in primary narcissism and taking gratification as its aim, as an acquiescence to the death drive, an irrational compensatory projection that rationalizes the lack of subjectivity in mass society, easing adaptation to the social condition of ego weakness. I've argued so far that Adorno's work contains an embryonic argument about the need to reconcile the drives with the autonomous subject. I want to add that this reconciliation involves a radical transformation of not only psychic conditions, but social conditions as well. I argue that Adorno's conception of mature subjectivity needs a transformation of the ego that it takes as its goal, not the repression of the drives, but rather their satisfaction. The satisfaction of drives could contribute to the transformation of society, making it more rational. Destructive drives would then not be repressed, dominated, and frustrated. Instead, the ego would direct them toward their fulfillment in the negation of that which should not be, the subject in thrall to collective narcissism and the repressive society that it mediates. This makes way for a new comportment for the subject and a new social order that might put an end to unnecessary suffering. Our potential capacity to meet this need is perhaps best articulated, I think, in Adorno's reconceptualization of aesthetic sublimation, which I read as a corrective to Marcuse's theory of non-repressive sublimation. I argue that for Adorno, non-repressive sublimation is possible, but the ego, rather than the drives, is its agent. Where Marcuse advocates a regression to the state of primary narcissism, aesthetic sublimation on Adorno's account is an act performed by an autonomous individual, 
Adorno also rejects Freud's sense of sublimation as the conversion of threatening sexual drives into socially productive, that is to say, socially adaptive practices. In this regard, it is important to note Adorno's assertion that it is by dint of its separation from empirical reality that art is capable of resisting, quote, reality's compulsion to identity. I've described how Adorno explicitly acknowledges the negativity of narcissism in its contemporary actualization, collective narcissism. And I have suggested that we read this as a rebuttal of Marcuse's glamorization of narcissism in Eros and Civilization. But I'm also arguing that the experience of narcissism is a kind of prerequisite for the self-restraint of the mature subject that Adorno theorizes. Aesthetic sublimation for Adorno is the, quote, removal of desire, and it is, quote, a process of spiritualization. In this sense, sublimation involves a withdrawal of the subject from its own appetitive and avaricious immediate connection with the object. This disinterestedness makes room for Eros as a desire to coexist with knowledge of the object as it is in itself. But in Adorno's philosophy, this narcissistic withdrawal of erotic energy is paired with an opposing movement toward the object. Adorno sees this movement modeled in the aesthetic sublimation of desire in art that produces beauty, what he calls the aesthetic shudder as the soul's tremolo between the animality of the involved and the all too human withdrawal inward. Adorno puts it like this, if it is more than mere indifference, the Kantian without interest must be shadowed by the wildest interest. And there is much to be said for the idea that the dignity of artworks depends on the intensity of the interest from which they are wrested. This alternation between differing psychic states preserves the object's freedom and its dignity, even as a subject comes to know the object, comes to know it on its own terms. As Hammer has it, this is Adorno seeking to, quote, affirm the subject in the moment of its involuntary annihilation. Only an ego transformed would be able to move between passionate desire for the object and self-restraint in this way. Only a mature subject, in Adorno's sense, could produce this knowledge out of and in service to eros rather than domination. Marcuse's mature ego, which has regressed behind individuation and conforms to the libidinal morality of the id, would not be capable of these operations. The aesthetic shudder, Adorno argues, quote, joins eros with knowledge. In this joining, a relation of solidarity is formed between subject and object. The subject gains knowledge of that aspect of the object that does not conform to the identity principle and thereby comes to recognize in itself that which resists and rebels against the reigning reality principle. Therefore, for Adorno, subjective autonomy doesn't require drive energies to be, quote, repressed, suppressed, or diverted by force. Instead, autonomy, understood as the opening up of social potentials, is achieved by way of solidarity between subject and object. The mature subject, as described by Adorno, can be an agent of social transformation because the knowledge that transcends society in thrall to the death drive makes it capable of thought and action that is not a mere unreflective reaction to its objective conditions. To be clear, this is not a plan or a program that Adorno proposes, and so my argument shouldn't be taken that way either. The self-renunciation we see in aesthetic sublimation as, quote, the transformation of something desired into something imagined remains part of art's shine, its illusory character. Nonetheless, this does not mean that this sublimation and this comportment does not enter into the empirical everyday life of the subject, just that it is now best exemplified and understood within the realm of art and philosophy and is not yet sufficiently common amongst individuals to make social transformation possible. But I argue that both remain a possibility for us. You've been very patient with me and I have just one more paragraph left. So to sum up, I see Marcuse's reworking of Freud's egocentric psychoanalytical theory as ironically a rather one-dimensional transvaluation of values. Narcissism is good and the drives are rational, 
the ego is an irrational manifestation of the death drive as the will to dominate or be dominated. There is more than a residue of idealism in this argument. It advances a transformation at the level of ideas, but the materiality of the drives and the social conditions they mediate, the very practices of everyday life must be transformed alongside our ideas. This is why I think Adorno's treatment of narcissism is more successful or more potentially more successful than Marcuse's. He locates a potentially transformative mo moment within current social conditions, rather than seeking a regression to a long surpassed psychic stage. In this sense, Adorno's philosophy takes the actuality of collective narcissism and the materiality of the drives seriously. Unlike Marcuse, Adorno doesn't present us with a new reality principle and a blueprint for the rational society that it governs. But what he does provide us with, and I argue that the value of this is inestimable, is a sense of how the drives are equally as dangerously regressive as they are potentially liberating. Which option wins out, I suggest, is always a matter of whether or not the ego is capable of intervening without repressing the drives. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kathy. Um, what a, 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 a rich and uh, provocative paper. So thanks, thanks very much. And I, um, I look forward to the, the commentaries now uh, from Roberto and Rogelio. And I'd like to also um, just invite the, um, uh, the audience to uh, think about uh, questions. And, and when you do have questions and or comments to please put them in the Q&A. Um, section, and then I can go through and uh, uh, and and take them from there. Um, so next up, we have um, Roberto uh, Longoni, uh, who, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was a uh, visiting fellow uh, with Kathy um, at the institute uh, uh, in the past semester. Um, Roberto is a professor of political philosophy in the Department of Humanities at the. Uh, Please um, forgive my, my Spanish, uh, Universidad Iberoamericana in Puebla. Uh, he has been working on um, the updating of classical critical theory of the Frankfurt School, along with the critique of the um, invented tradition of Habermas and Pana, the new readings of Marx and the political philosophy of popular insurrections. In particular, his PhD research actually focuses on an interpretation of the popular revolt that broke out in Chile, in October 2019 from the perspective of uh, VAT critique or value critique um, uh, and open Marxism enhanced by Adorno's negative epistemology and his understanding of critical theory uh, as non-identical knowledge. And um, this was one of the, uh, the um, uh, topics of the uh, month long um, workshop uh, that, uh, that Roberto uh, 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 presented uh, along with Rogelio when, when they were here. It was a very uh, fascinating um, uh, 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 session and, and these have all been recorded and they're available on our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to check them out, you can do so. Um, and then we have Rogelio uh, Realado, uh, who's a PhD student in uh, subjectivity and critical theory at the Instituto de uh, Ciencias Sociales y Humanidades Alfonso Velez Pliego, uh, BUAP, um, as well as professor in international relations at the same university. He is uh, editor of uh, uh, Creatius uh, Revista Critica de Politica Internacional, uh, a publication of the Institute, uh, Instituto de Ciencias Juridicas de, uh, de Puebla. His research interests um, uh, revolve around the critique of nationalism and fascism uh, from a non-orthodox perspective, as well as different expressions of international anti-capitalism. Um, his current research consists of the critical elaboration of the concept of fascism and its relation to capitalism. And that was uh, also a, 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 a topic on which he presented um, at this workshop, which was really also uh, fascinating. And I, I invite you all to, to take a look at, uh, at the, um, you know, the various sessions that we have uh, recorded. Um, so first off, Roberto, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Katie, of course, to, to of this invitation. I am very happy to, to make a comment of his her excellent work. 
So, uh, of course, the Institute, Samir, uh, Hu Jen Wallis, uh, and Devin, uh, who make this possible in a material way. So, I want to thank you all. Uh, I'm going to read a, a really precise comment about Katie's work. Um, first, I'm going to make a general comment about what I think is really important in, in her work. And then I'm going to put some two questions or two things that we can continue to dialogue uh, of your work. So I'm going to start. Uh, as mentioned by Jordi Maiso in the prologue of the book Radical Philosophy, Conversations with Marcuse, the popularity and appreciation that Marcuse continues to have within the academic and militant spheres has often been an obstacle when it comes to the serious confrontation of his approaches to try to update his concerns and, of course, to point out his possible insufficiencies or problems. To more than one person, the image of the old Frankfurtian critic arguing headedly with Danny the Red or giving a speech to the young Parisian rebels or to the Berkeley students together with Angela Davis has seemed enough to point out the power and topicality of his figure. However, Although Marcuse made an attempt to approach the struggles of his time and hid it from a different character and attitude, I am not saying better or worse from that of Adorno. And although it is true that his texts in many cases are somewhat more digestible than those of Adorno, this does not imply that the power and scope of his ideas can be reduced as has also been done to two or three slogans or images. A critical, historically specific thought concerned with understanding the transformations of the present from the point of view of its possible transformation must fight against the images and slogans that make it a cliche that can be translated and absorbed by the cultural industry. One of the first conclusions I came to after reviewing Katie's interesting work on Marcuse and Adorno is that she was making a very important contribution in this sense. In other words, his work is a serious and very pertinent attempt to break with certain cliches that surround the figures and thought of Adorno and Marcuse, an attempt to be consistent with the historical character of the so-called classical critical theory. In this sense, I believe that one of its greatest successes is that it does not fall into the dichotomy that still waits heavily in many intellectual and academic circles today. This dichotomy is the one that debates between affirming that the differences between Marcuse and Adorno are absolute and that there is no meeting point between the two, an issue supported more strongly in their famous discussion about the student movement, and the other, in the other hand, and affirming that their differences are non-existent, that they tend to be exaggerated and they are in fact identical. I believe that one of Katie's central arguments is that there are shared concerns and sensitivities between the two of them, and that these shared concerns and sensitivities imply a dialectical intellectual relationship between Adorno and Marcuse, which can be understood as a dialogue that, based on their encounters and disagreements, their fractures, tensions, and agreements, becomes fertile ground to illuminate the power and limits of both. This dialogue, as Katie also points out, can be clarified and made more complex if we pay attention to the critical understanding, understanding that both thinkers have of psychoanalysis and aesthetics. Unfortunately, my limited knowledge of these two branches prevents me from making a more precise and profound critique of the question of primary and secondary narcissism, the question of the life and death impulses or drives, the principle of pleasure, reality, performance, or on the question of sublimation. I would just like to make a comment on one of the ideas that seem to me to be the most central to Katie's work in order to continue to confront the thought processes of Marcuse and Adorno in a dialectical and critical manner. One of the criticisms that to me seem to be the most powerful of the entire, entire essay and which I share is that Marcuse's critical proposal is based on an anthropological ontological principle 
which affirms the positive, emancipatory, and transhistorical character of hu human impulses and drives, as well as its allegated deviation or corruption by the capitalist social logic. In this regard, I understand that Katie points out, and again, I agree with her statement, that from an Adornian perspective, criticism cannot be answered to a positive anthropological ontological principle, since there is a risk of a relapse into idealism that will leave all critical effort without any immanent and historically specific possibilities of overcoming itself. It is important to remember that one of the strongest criticisms that Adorno directed against Heidegger was precisely that his thought process was based on a prima philosophia whose horizon and foundation was the return to a non-existent and impossible original and transhistorical subjectivity in which the contradictions of the word did not prevail. Adorno's critique goes further, explaining that Heidegger's ontology is not simply the product of a certain subjective ignorance, but rather is the expression of a historical moment in which the obfuscation framework of capitalism has spread so strongly that, that, that alternatives that are proposed to its domination are alternatives that refer to a previous ideal state of reconciliation. Traces of this can be found in some of the proposals of open Marxists in theories about the commons, in Walter Benjamin, in Lukács, also in Michael J. Thompson's recent critique of the domestication of critical theory, which falls back on an ontology that dom domesticates the critical theory again, and of course, on Marcuse. As Katie points out, we could say that in Marcuse's appeal to an ideal state of subjectivity supported by a positive vision of primary narcissism and drives, there is a relapse into ontology that Adorno categorically rejected due to its dangers and insufficiencies. Dangers and insufficiencies that do not belong only to Marcuse, but also could appear in Adorno sometimes, and yeah. from which, as they both knew, as well as Horkheimer, Benjamin, critical theory is not safe by the simple fact of being aware of their historical and contradictory origin. Lastly, I would just like to leave two queries that are not necessarily disagreements, but rather questions that I would like Katie to clarify or go deeper into. One, the question about love. Uh, I remember that when we met Katie in Vancouver a few months ago, she told us that the theme of her work in relation to critical theory revolved around the love. The concept itself, we know that in a capitalist world, obviously refers to a series of commonplaces that many of us do not like. I know from what we were able to talk about that obviously Katie has a conce conception of love and its relationship with the reflections of critical theory that have nothing to do with the conception that the culture and industry sells off about it. However, in the text, I didn't see that conception so clearly I would like to know if you could elaborate on it. Uh, my question is, why do you love to talk about Adorno's and Marcuse's critique? And two, although I believe, as I said, that Katie's work is a contribution to breaking down certain cliches that hover around the figure and thought of Marcuse and Adorno, I was also left with the feeling that beyond a minor comment, because there's a comment, but I think uh, we have to go deeper in that, it was no sufficient, sufficiently precise in pointing out that to say that Marcuse puts the emphasis on impulse and drives and Adorno on a stringent, a stringent ego does not imply that Marcuse did not pay attention to the rational and that Adorno was pure reason and no sensitivity. Mm -hmm. I think that a clearer explanation of this is necessary, necessary just so as not to reproduce the cliche this cliche that Marcuse is sensitive and Adorno is not sensitive and is pure reason, no? So uh, I think that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roberto. Um, Samir, do you want me to respond to Roberto first or 
do we want to move to Rahelio first, or how should we? Do this? I, I should have actually ask you that. What would what would you prefer? Um, I, I had kind of thought that that you'd receive both um, comments uh, t together, one after the other. But if you'd like to uh, to take on um, a, a or, or provide a response uh, to Roberto now, you, you're free to do that as well. Um, Rahelio, would you mind if I do? Do you mind waiting a little bit? No, 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 no. I have I have a few <laughs> quick responses. I can I could I could talk about this forever, and you know this paper is on narcissism, and I don't want my voice to be narcissistically present throughout. So I don't want to take up too much time. But I'm really excited about these ideas, and so I, I'm I'm just fast. I'm just happy to have the chance to talk about them. But um, to go back to the question of um, you know where is love in the place of this and why love and also sensitivity both of those i think are related and and in part i guess um the reason why this um why i i may be risking this kind of dichotomy or i am not challenging the cliche of you know treating marcuse as this sort of sensitive thinker and Adorno is all about the the sort of, um, you know, the, the, the thinking epistemological subject in this particular piece is that this is chapter, I guess this is chapter two and, um, and, and the, those aspects are in other chapters and maybe they will get folded into this as the, as the book evolves a little bit more, but I can speak to that. And I, I want to say, first of all, sensitivity I, I link that with embodiment, and I think that embodiment is an incredibly um, important aspect of Adorno's thought. There's a chapter that I'm planning on writing on the on on desire and animal involvement, and you know, going through this comparison of Marcuse and Adorno, I think there is this cliche that Marcuse is about eros, and it's about the free flow of eros, and they, and all of these kinds of things, and Adorno is um, this this negative. Um, you know, he's got nothing to say that's good about the body or love or which is absolutely untrue. I mean, when you think about what, again, I, at the risk of just reversing the polls, which I also don't want to do, um, the, the fact that Marcuse talks about an unleashing of Eros and then ties it to intellectual life and denies the fact that there could be, that, that, that this doesn't turn us into sex maniacs, to me seems, seems, speaks of kind of prudishness. Like it's, it's a lack of, of, of a sense of the sensitive body. Whereas in Adorno's work, there are these beautiful moments where he's you know, speaking about the ecstasy of desire and longing for another with this sort of sense of body embodied desire, which it's hot, like it's sexy. And um, and so that I think will come into play in the book. Um, the question of love, I'm you know what I'm going to leave that because maybe I don't want to talk too much. And Rahelio, I know you know has prepared a statement, and so maybe we'll we'll hear what Rahelio has to say, and then uh, I'll return to that because I I do want to address that question too. Is, does that work? That works works perfectly, but if you want to answer that, it's okay for by me either way. So I'm gonna yes. wait and see if if I can tie yeah. your comments into the rest. Yeah, perfect. So, <laughs> uh, well, thank you, thank you very much. First of all, of all, I I have to comment that this is something that maybe Samir and and Katie is like kind of tired to hear it from us, from me and from Robert, I mean, that uh, we are obviously not native speakers, so <laughs> English native speakers. So we have a lot of problems with language. And uh, if somebody doesn't understand something that I am saying, just could put it in the chat and I could make an effort to be more understandable for you. And uh, Saying that, I want to, to thank a lot for the invitation. It is a pleasure for me to be with you because we had the opportunity to spend some time in Vancouver, as, as Samir said, and uh, myself, Roberto, I mean, and obviously we coincided, coincided with Cathy, uh, with whom we shared several afternoons, uh, exchanging some ideas, meals, etc. So it was a, a great, great time. And the truth is that all the time in the Institute was very wonderful, not only because of the hospitality of the university, but above all, 
because of all the people associated with the institute with whom we were able to interact. Obviously, the first and that least is undoubtedly Professor Samir Handesha, who continues to make these collaborations possible and to whom we will be eternally grateful. But also, as I mentioned, we had the opportunity to meet Casey, who was very generously invited us to participate in this event. And we accepted with much enthusiasm and, and a lot of respect for her work. Uh, I also see that there is Hilda Fernandez over here, and we love Hilda, and surely more people with whom we had contact. Uh, and well, and anyway, I, I just want to thank SFU, the, the Institute, Samir Gandesha, and especially in this occasion, in this occasion uh, to Kathy Kilo once again for giving us the opportunity to continue meeting and surely extending the cycle of complicity with the people who accompany us. So thank you very much. And for me, it was very difficult to put forward my comments because perhaps I have the vice of thinking that when you nod it all the time in a dialogue or in a conversation, at least three things can happen. The first, the most genuine one, <laughs> is that you are not really understanding the argument and therefore take the easy way out of complicity. <laughs> the second is that are not taking seriously what is proposed and dismissed it with the coldest of consensus. And the third one, perhaps the worst, is that there is a condescending mood about what is proposed. If I have, a, if I have to, to, to enter into any of these characterizations, I could definitely choose the first one because it is a complex text and I do not pretend to assume that I can manage with the agility in such a well-elaborated argument. But because of this vice, I did not want to allow myself to get here by simply nodding at Cathy's words, and yet I had to do it. But uh, this should be understood as a compliment, at least a genuine one on my part, if that means anything, because despite my refusal to stop raising critical elements about what has been written, I had to make a formal change of attitude and dedicate myself to learning and absorbing, uh, and absorbing as much as I could from her work. And having said that, I could like to begin my, my commenting that, uh, um, that Adorno's critique of Marcus that Cassie develops has seemed to me extremely pertinent. I try to make it my own and think about it in some keys that I would like Cathy and perhaps the people who accompany us could comment on. The one that seems to me the most important is the role of social objectivity. On many occasions, we have asked ourselves, uh, I mean, we, Robert and I, because we work a, a lot together here in, in Puebla, and we have asked ourselves why the reading of critical theory, or rather fundamentally, why Adorno does not directly, or at least not in, not in a concise way, as a blow on the table, establish critical categories on capitalism. However, also, this question can have several answers from self-censorship to the way out of the notions debate that militant Marxism of his time held. We can identify the treatment he gives to these categories in a way that surrounds us, that surrounds his arguments. Why is this important? Because it seems to us that in the elaboration of a critical theory of capitalism and of the very understanding of capitalism society, of capitalist society, we can identify many of the elements that allow us to account for social objectivity and with it, the rejection of transformation, only the immediacy that comes from the mere will of the subject. That is to say, the will of the, so the subject can transform, but it can only do so on the plane of immediacy especially if it lacks criticism. At the same time, we can see that the very development of objectivity throws us into this, into an almost critical impossibility that does not allow us to be the subjects either. At first, this point may seem terribly depressing, just at that end. But I think Cathy's arguments also move in, direction, in a direction that denies the attitude but at the same time, the nice easy ways out and, and relapses into essentialisms, even when they point to attractive possibilities for the radical transformation of society, such as Marcuse's own. For me, um, as, as a Postonian, it has seemed extremely important to distinguish in Cassie's arguments, the sensitivity that 
it opens in Adorno to take into this into account the historically specific transformations and with it the unfolding of social objectivity that should not be confused with a fully self-constitutive image of the relation of domination whose only possible way out is that of total annihilation. In this sense, one of the first questions, well, I, I have some questions too, but <laughs> they're like big open questions. So yeah, if you like, you can answer that, but if not, maybe it is only for, for, for thinking. And so in this sense, one of the first questions that I, that I think that is very, very relevant to address has to do with the role of objectivity in Cassie's presentation and in Adorno's thought in general. On that first point, I might have drafted a question. Somehow, the answer to capitalist domination built around immediacy with an essentialist dimension that empowers the subject, idealism could be placed here, could take a place here, offers a minimum satis of satisfaction in the face of urgency of our times, characterized by violence and devastation quantitatively different from that of other historical moments. To what extent can a position that rejects such answers that constructs more negative questions while accounting for the gigantic challenge presented with social objectivity offer us a panorama that throws at least a glimmer of encouragement. Is looking for this especially encouraged by critical thinking even a valid question? On the other hand, appropriate in Cassie's text, I am interested in fascism and its contemporary dimension. And I feel uh, like, Pretty weird to 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 talk of fascism while while Samir is here because <laughs> I know that he is a, a big reference of the on the on the subject, but I think that maybe this could uh, uh, interrelate me, Samir, and obviously the, the works on Casius are, are Robert, of course, and many people around here. So I don't know to what extent Cassie had uh, this in mind, I mean fascism in mind, as the, uh, she was elaborating her argument, but it is clear that there is a dimension that she recovers from Adorno's critique that is very important for thinking about such a form of violence today. Cassie already gave us a bit of an update of this argument with her example of social media, uh, social media worries, I mean. But it would be very interesting to develop in a bit more detail how the transformations of capitalism, especially thinking about the current stage that is expressed through the profound crisis of the anachronism of value, has changed somewhat or not the experience of collective narcissism. From, from my point of view, fascism, as an expression of redemption of the subject to the collectivity can no longer be thought of in the same terms as in the 20th century. This does not mean that a fascist, a fascist government is impossible. In fact, we are very close to it, but that we will not face a, fa a, a mass movement with a dynamic almost identical to that of the 20th century. And this has to do with the subject in the state of capitalism. Can this still be explained through collective narcissism? We find ourselves, I think, in front of a condition of fascism as a social practice that discharges its violence in the feti fetishization, fetishization of, the, of the other, which implies the very blocking of aesthetic experience. If I more or less understand your argument, Cathy, but, but, but then how valid is the, this criticism of Adorno to understand the present? And, and the third and last point, I think also perhaps already more or less disposed with the previous ones, is to ask about something that also in times of urgency becomes a central concern, and that is the political consequences of the argument you develop. I know that this question is somewhat awkward because I understand that the questions should be made about what is contained in the text and not about what is missing. But in fact, I think that uh, your text makes it very clear that there are important political implications in the theoretical development. Otherwise, it could only be Adorno making corrections to Marcus uh, as a school teacher. In Spanish, we say, leyendo la plana, reading, reading the page. So what does the existence of a narcissistic subject, a pseudo object in neoliberal capitalism imply? 
What implications does it have for you to bring psychoanalytic theory in Adorno's philosophy to our concrete experience, that is, to the experience of the crisis in its current stage? Is a mature subject possible, the satisfaction of drives for the transformation in a moment of society that seems frankly, frankly agonizing? And that's the question if we can possibly have some comments from you, just, just to finish. I don't want to people to think on me as a, as a pessimist or, or, or at least as a complete pessimist. So as I like to think of critical theory, it is like standing in front of a completely black absorbing paint, recognizing it. But instead of thinking that there is nothing more to do in front of it, that everything is finished, it's only dark, it is rather to take up the challenge of continuing to paint even in the absence of color. And with that, I just want to thank you again. Thank you very much for your text, for your presentation. And thank you for having awakened so many interests and concerns that I will certainly try to continue and to reproduce here in Puebla, wherever I am. Thank you. Thanks, Rahelia. Those are very tough questions. Um, I think, you know, my preliminary response to, to your prods which I very much appreciate and I think are absolutely necessary and not at all peripheral to the project, um, is that I actually, I think that Adorno's analysis of collective narcissism is actually very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it, I think it anticipates the the neoliberal capitalist moment that we're in, in the sense that he is already moving beyond, for example, the way he thought about the culture industry in Dialectic of Enlightenment, um, and looking at the ways in which collectivities are starting to form outside of the overt um, fascism of the 1930s and the 1940s. Um, the collectives that he's talking about in 1962 are not um, overtly identifying themselves as fascist, but Adorno is seeing those elements within them. And I think we can say the same about a lot of our, uh, <laughs> the ways in which we experience reality today in the 21st century. Do th th this is the whole question about are we in a fascist moment? Um, where I want to ask, where is fascism not right now? I, I, I think that the question is not where can we identify this or that as fascism, but can we identify a place that isn't saturated with fascism? Um, and and the 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 dark moments and the dark moments you know, it feels like, no, it is just that black wall that you're talking about. Um, but what I see in Adorno's philosophy, and granted, you know, I, I may be a bit of a rogue for, for, for feeling this way about Adorno, but I see hope in Adorno's philosophy because he does not give up on the well, he focuses on the contradiction, right? The contradiction of the ideal and the actual. And that means not giving up on the ideal. And what I mean by ideal is the ideal of freedom, the ideal of autonomy, being able to think beyond one's current objective conditions that are so um, paralyzing. And I wanna draw that out of the philosophy because I think that that's, that's, that's something that we need at the moment. We need to think about how it is that we can still think in this moment. And is it still possible? I actually, I want to assert that yes, it is still possible. Now we might be you know, completely at odds about this. Um, and I might be a bit too idealistic perhaps in my outlook, but, um, but otherwise, I don't know why I would write about any of this stuff. I need to feel that there's something, some kind of a, a hope. And I, and, I, and I still think that it is, it's incredibly relevant. I don't really have beyond that, you know, a good argument about why this is still relevant to our contemporary moments. And obviously I need to think about that more carefully. Um, but 
uh, I do need to thank you for those questions because I think they're very important to consider. Um, so what are the political implications? What's missing from the presentation? What are the political implications? Yeah, okay, so that's a good question. And I don't know if I can answer it at the moment, but I thank you very much for it. Okay, um, Kathy, that, that's your response. Thanks very much, um, Kathy, for your responses. And, and, uh, and a special thanks to uh, both Roberto and uh, Rogelio for those uh, terrific uh, and, and probing um, uh, uh, comments. And so now we have approximately half an hour remaining and, and already we have a number of excellent questions from the audience. So let's, let's get to those right away then. Uh, first up is Hilda Fernandez. Uh, who was uh, who uh, Rogelio mentioned earlier? She's uh, a longtime associate um, and collaborator, co-conspirator uh, uh, with the institute, and she asks, um, "I want to ask, uh, how would narcissism deal with the imaginary trap that it constitutes? By which I mean the identitarian principle of the image of self, in which the subject takes itself as identical to itself." which triggers fascination on the one side or aggressivity and competitive, competitiveness, competitiveness on the other side um, that uh, is a, an obstacle to the social relationship or the social bond. Kathy, can you, can you also read along with, uh, with the questions? Do you, do you see them um, the Q&A? It might be best if you also look at them. Yeah. Um, and then maybe I'll just give you another one and then, then uh, a couple more after you answer. Um, so uh, we also have another uh, old friend, uh, a personal friend uh, of mine, as, as is Hilda, uh, longtime friend, uh, John Abramite, and um, uh, 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 illustrious critical theory scholar um, and biographer of the early Max Horkheimer, uh, who's also contributed uh, much to the Institute. He's done a lot of uh, uh, work with us over the uh, past years. It's great to, to have you uh, present, John. Um, and so here's, uh, here's a question um, or a question slash comment. Thanks so much for your very nuanced and stimulating talk, Kathy. Uh, but my concern here is just that Marcuse often gets read as a romantic who advocates a return to unmediated nature, when in fact he argues that a progressive regression to a form of subjectivity that moves beyond bourgeois, bourgeois subjectivity can only take place after a socialization to maturity. Um, hmm. So maybe take those two on and then we've got a couple more uh, questions as well. Okay, well, hi, Hilda and John both. Nice to nice that you're here and thank you for your comments. Um, okay, so narcissism um, and the trap that it constitutes, the identitarian principle of the image of self in which the subject takes itself as identical to itself, triggers fascination on one side. Right, I mean, this is this is the key problem that I think I'm trying to work through. Is this is is this problem of narcissism embroiled with the death drive, and I, I don't think narcissism does deal with it. I think that's the issue. Is that I think that is like the 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 definition of of how narcissism functions. So I think what I'm trying to present is the idea that in Adorno's philosophy, although he, he may not himself articulate it as such, I think there's this sort of potential for thinking about the ways in which the experience of narcissism can be, uh, I guess, sort of uh, redeemed in a sense, um, that, that, that it's not about um, a giving over of the self to narcissism, it's rather a, a, a movement between this kind of withdrawal and and engagement or even um, you know sort of passionate desire um, for the object that is important here and it's it's a it's a it's a dialectical movement between the two um, and I think that's 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 the important thing that I'm getting at is that narcissism on its own, without it being tempered in some way, without it being, um, you know, I suppose directed, um, is, is precisely how you describe. And I think what Adorno's philosophy has, allows us to do is to think about, can we think about narcissism perhaps differently? Can we, can we put it to different uses? Um, I don't know if that's, if that's really 
a clear answer to Hilda's question. Um, and then the other question I think from John was it about, oh, um, my concern here is just that Marcuse often gets read as a romantic, right? Um, progressive, yes, I, 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 I did have the, the phrase progressive regression in there at some point. Um, and I don't know if John's uh, question was meant to, because there's another comment here, but maybe if I can just speak to this one. Um, I think I think we're talking about I think what John is trying to draw my attention to is the is the fact that Marcuse is talking about a process that there is a return uh, a progressive regression that takes place after socialization to maturity and yes I think that's a fair criticism of my presentation because I didn't get into that um, enough um, and that's true right there's this idea that um, and uh, this also has to do a lot in Marcuse's argument with the problem of scarcity, right? And so scarcity and technological advances, the technological advances have meant that we, we don't have to deal with scarcity in the same way, which means that this frees us up to develop our capacities, which then allows for a regression. Um, and in this, again, I think John, this comment is really important because it, it shows how there are similarities between Adorno and Marcuse and that, on the one hand, uh, these similarities mean that they are, they are, they are aware of the need for a certain kind of maturation. Um, but ultimately, I think that that the mature subject that Marcuse is talking about needs to be capable of letting go of the ego, of allowing the ego to become weakened further. Um, and I think that's that's ultimately the difference between Adorno and Marcuse. That also come, points out another problem here, which is, you know, this reliance on the notion of um, technology freeing us from scarcity. This is not only within Marcuse, it also runs through Adorno. And I think, you know, it, it, it's something that we have to rethink because we, this, is, this is not a situation that we in the 21st century are facing. We are we we have gotten to the point where technology has brought us to the edge of our survival. So um, so that problematic needs to be thought through and thought through differently. Great, thanks um, very much, Kathy. Uh, let's now move to um, Silvio. So I'll keep reading this out just for the benefit of the video and, and so on. But sure. if you read along, that would be probably helpful to you. I'm yeah. reading it for the benefit of uh, those who will who will see the uh, the tape of this later. So um, yeah. uh, could it be possible that Adorno presents some difficulties to understanding what is the meaning of Marcuse's polymorphous uh, perspective? Um, that is not a question of identitarian organization. Uh, polymorphous structures are connected with a multiplicity and not identity. Let us remember that the constitutive conflicts presented by the image of uh, Orpheus and uh, Narcissus, these um, images are based not in an identitarian relation, but a, but a polymorphous um, uh, relation object and subject present a multiplicity of, of, of relations. Um, that is one difficulty uh, to understand the relation between Adorno and Mar Adorno's and Marcuse's theories. Uh, we can remember how, Mar how Marcuse thinks about utopia, which is not a paradise lost, maybe a paradise regained as well, uh, but a horizon of struggles. Right. Okay. So I think that the the issue here is this kind of um, the the well the problem of identity, right? So for 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 Marcuse, the the problem of identity becomes, or identity is something that must be jettisoned in favor of something that's kind of in an interesting way. I think similar to 
um, the affect theory that we might find in Deleuze and Guattari for something or something like that. Um, or uh, maybe I should say it, it sort of predicates it. Um, I think that um, this is another part of the, the, the question here, positioning Adorno as a kind of um, more traditional thinker and Marcuse as a more, you know, polyvalent open kind of thinker. Um, I think for Adorno, what I find valuable in Adorno's philosophy is the kind of um, the really richly dialectical way that Adorno thinks about identity. It's not just about the identity principle. And of course, I didn't talk about that in the presentation, but identity is also um, involved in the, the, the desire for knowledge. We must identify in order to know something. So um, I think, is this a difficulty with Adorno understanding Marcuse's theoretical framework? I don't think so, because I think actually Adorno does understand Marcuse's theoretical framework and rejects it. I think he rejects it because it doesn't allow for the, the, the kind of knowledge that Adorno argues is uh, absolutely essential for the subject to gain any agency, for the subject to be able to enter into that relationship of solidarity that I talked about. Um, the, the polymorphous relations that we see in Marcuse, from an Adornian perspective, albeit, you know, I will, I will admit, don't allow for any of that. Um, I happen to agree with Adorno. Um, I, 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 I think Marcuse is um, not as useful for thinking through how we can develop some kind of subjective agency and some kind of collective um, and based uh, collective movements based on solidarity. Um, I have a, a question, Kathy, and um, I really like your emphasis on uh, Adorno's emphasis on, on autonomy. And, and uh, he's very clear as well um, that he's uh, a, a very uh, uh, much opposed to the Kantian understanding of it. And let's say the yes. understanding of it, which, which we could call still a sort of repressive idea of, yeah. uh, of freedom. Um, that, um, you know, uh, what, just trying to remember the, the, the wording in negative dialectics, that, that autonomy without the object is, is illusory, right? That yeah. it's, self, it's self undermining uh, if, if it's detached from the object. Um, yeah. And uh, I think this, this question of autonomy in a political sense, I'm trying to, to, to draw upon uh, what uh, uh, both Roberto and, or this is the spirit of Roberto and Rogelio's um, comments. How do we understand this in kind of political terms? Um, this is a great, you know, uh, uh, moment in the lecture from 1967, the aspects of uh, new right wing extremism right. Um, that uh, uh, that actually Peter Gordon highlights in, the, in, in his piece in The Nation, which, he, you know, he actually calls the wound of democracy. Right. And this is a key yeah. argument in, 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 in that lecture, but it's in negative dialectics as well. And that is that the um, the, the, the uh, movement to collective narcissism has to do with the um, objective conditions of society, uh, yeah. which are conditions of unfreedom, but the institutional framework of uh, bourgeois democracy is one that promises freedom in the specific sense of autonomy, that one has control over, one can determine one's, one's yeah. to, to a degree. And, and it, this is what constitutes the wound of democracy, the contradiction here. Yes. And, and I wonder if we can say that the, the, there's now a kind of widespread abandonment on the left of, of con conceptions of freedom, this discussion for several years now, of autonomy, fatigue, and so on. And at one level, you want to say, well, my God, this is a real sort of betrayal of what the left has always stood for. But maybe at some deeper level, there's a recognition that that promise is no longer even there. And we have people talking about yeah. neo-feudalism, for example. Um, yeah. where, you know, we're not even in a kind of capitalist society where, where an imminent critique of its logic could yield some sort of, you know, future-oriented politics. So yeah, yeah, that's I'm really interested in, 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 in hearing about that because that then really gets us to this question of, uh, and I love the way you put this, you know, uh, the question isn't where is fascism, 
but where is fascism not? Yeah, right? yeah. Um, so I, I wonder if that those two can be connected. So um, I'll, I'll give you that, but then uh, can I give you a question from the audience? Or, or, and, yeah, yeah. Okay, and, sure. Yeah. Um, so the next one is a, a colleague from a colleague of uh, of mine in the Department of Humanities, also done a lot of work with the, the institute. It's really nice to have you know people who've uh, been um, involved for a long time with us. Uh, so Alessandra uh, Capardoni, who's also very uh, much involved with the, the Le Cancel Salon, as uh, is uh, Hilda Fernandez, who's one of the, the founders of it. So um, Alessandra asks, with respect to Adorno, I wonder if you can speak more about the need to reconcile the drive with the autonomous subject. Uh, the drive cannot be um, accessed by the subject, only its effects can be read. Uh, when yeah. they can be read at all. Um, mm -hmm. The drive remains at the level of the unconscious. How does Adorno's theory reconcile uh, con concrete experience? And do you agree with him? So really a uh, great question. Um, yeah. Thanks, Alessandra. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Um, yes, okay. So this is this is where I think more work needs to be done to articulate what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the ego and the autonomous subject, because they are not the same thing. I am not trying to conflate them yet. For Adorno, as well as, you know, in, in my reading of Adorno, there is an important relationship between them. Um, we cannot, and, and again, this is not, this is, this is something I'm pulling out of Adorno. It's not very well articulated in Adorno. He kind of moves between talking about ego and subject, and it, it, it's kind of, um, especially in negative dialectics, it's very, uh, it feels very fluid, but if you sit down with it, with the text, and you work through it, you understand that it's not even so much that the ego, because uh, I, 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 I'm still developing the language to talk about this, because in my presentation, I talked about how the subject is predicated on the ego, but that's actually, in fact, an incorrect way of putting it, because the transformation of the ego is in part due to our capacity for autonomy, right? So it's like this, it's it's this um, mediated relationship between ego and, and subject. So yes, the, the subject doesn't have access to the drives. So it's not the subject that's doing anything with the drives. That's why there needs to be an ego. There can't be this, this, um, this, th there, there can't be a weak, the problem is a weakening of the ego, and they're also. But the the opposite, a strengthening of the ego, which would be a kind of masterful subject that, or sorry, excuse me, a masterful ego that represses and um, and and disciplines, um, will not allow for an autonomous subject, right? So the 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 ego is the one who has to facilitate the flow of drives. The ego is the one who that or the the thing the entity that that needs to be in touch with those drives but the work of the autonomous subject is to engage in critical self reflection and part of what that what the subject is able to do is to work on understanding how behavior works and yes of course we can't get access to the drives as epistemological subjects um but we can see some of the effects of the drives and we can study that and we can start to understand how that 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 sort of those different aspects of the of the conscious and unconscious self work um and so i think you know in adorno's philosophy as messy as it seems there's a real logic there that there's a a mediating relationship between ego and autonomous subjectivity um that 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 um that they 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 form together they 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 shape one another and that's why we need the ego to be present not as a repressive agent but as a facilitator of of drives a a, 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 a an entity that can move them in the direction and we can only do that we can only understand what direction to move those drives in or the ego can only understand what how to do that with the help of the epistemological subject. So it's this kind of imbricated relationship. I hope that answers the, the question. Um, and, oh, I, I think I had an answer or I had something to say, Samir, about your comment about um, 
the wound of, of democracy. Um, and yes, I think, um, but I think it may have left for the moment. I'll think about it. It's left the building. <laughs> it's left the building. Oh, well, I guess I was going to say that, you know, in writing about autonomy and freedom, I, I have sort of made these these statements where you know freedom is empty of meaning. Freedom, you know, there's freedom is but a mockery, and and I and I think that's 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 true. Is that it's so hard to believe in the ideal of freedom, especially when you know the 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 tendency is to look back to see you know how did we define freedom in the bourgeois era? What 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 was that ideal about? And 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 I think that's again what I find the strength in Adorno's philosophy is that although you know he's talking about Kant and Hegel and freedom in these philosophies, he's not just talking about the 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 the, the bourgeois notion of freedom that they that they present. He's interrogating it and thinking about it in the present and how it impacts. How how our own present lives, um, our relationship to freedom is different, and what we need to do to think about autonomy um, otherwise. Okay, thanks a lot. And so we do have a, a, another question that is quite oh uh, Elliot's question. Sorry, before we get on to the anonymous. So uh, two more questions, and then we'll we'll wrap. Um, so Elliot Swain asks, I have a simple clarifying question for Dr. Kilo. Where in Adorno can um, best be found the moments of eroticism and engagement with the body uh, to which uh, she referred? Um, there's beautiful parts in Minimum Moralia. There's, of course, very bitter parts in Minimum Moralia, and they're often within the same sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would I would certainly recommend minimum moralia. But the thing that really gets me is Adorno's discussion of um, Romeo and Juliet in his essay on um, Huxley in Prisms, and he also makes similar comments in the lectures on aesthetics. Um, he talks about Juliet's longing for Romeo in just the most utopian terms, because he's he's arguing that this that there's or he's suggesting there's an implication that in erotic longing there's there's this is a this is a this is a sign of our desire for reconciliation. You know, it's also the desire for our it's it, a reconciliation is also a desire to dissolve into the other and to consume the other. And that's why there needs to be this moment of withdrawal because we don't want to escape into the other. We don't want to consume the other, but the, the, the moment of the, the desire to hold back the dawn that Juliet um, expresses is just discussed so beautifully by Adorno there it's it's I mean I would say that his essay on Huxley where he accuses Huxley of a kind of um uh prudishness I suppose or I I think he he talks about a um uh um a combination of prudishness and pornography or something like that I'd have to read it again to be very clear is just a really wonderful example of how Adorno's thinking, his criticism, um, just sort of opens up this sort of moment of, um, I don't know, sensual longing and desire that I just think is so hot. Okay, great, thanks. So uh, last question now, uh, which relates actually uh, somewhat to Alessandra's previous question. Uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, if we have time left, I was wondering if you could show some, some thoughts on what role, if any, the unconscious played for both thinkers, especially um, the unconscious in this more collective manifestation, uh, given the critical focus on the drives and things. Did the unconscious lose its importance uh, for either? I'm not sure if um, I'm understanding the question properly, but um, I think, you know, the drives and the instincts are, 
unconscious. So the the focus on drives and instincts is a focus on the unconscious. Um, the, the role of the unconscious for both thinkers, I think, is is really kind of well, it's certainly fraught for Adorno, right? I mean, it's 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 a complex, um, potentially dark space that we need to take account of and we need to to um, acknowledge, not just acknowledge, but also learn how to navigate and not, I don't want to use the word control. See, the thing is, we don't even have a proper language for it, but I don't want to use the word control because that sounds so repressive. But I think what Adorno was getting at is that the, 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 the impulse to repress drives is itself, you know, people call it primitive. And that a mature subject would need to move beyond that. And a Marcuse, Marcuse, I think, would agree with that, right? That the, 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 the repression is primal and a mature subject needs to move beyond repression. But for Marcuse, this means uh, a kind of opening up of the drives and allowing the drives themselves, because they have this sort of inborn morality or rationality, to, to just sort of overwhelm. Um, and I think for Adorno, his sense of the unconscious um, maybe has a little bit more darkness to it. For, for Marcuse, we can convert the death drive into eros. Eros and, and death drive can kind of move back and forth. For Adorno, I think that's not the case. I think that for Adorno, the, the death drive is not going to gain satisfaction in that kind of repurposing that that Marcuse seems to imply is possible, so um, so that's why I'm, I'm I'm saying you know we can we can find satisfaction for the drive in the destruction of that which shouldn't exist of of, of wrong society. Um, now, what are the political implications of that? Back to Rahelio's comment, um, the political implications of that are painful because. We don't have time. We don't have time to learn how to do this in a in a substantial social way. Um, nonetheless, I think we can't give up, and I think we, as critical theorists and people who are in a position of teaching, um, need to insist upon this. Um, need to insist upon the importance of uh, self-reflection, of, of critical thinking, of um, the striving for autonomy, whether or not we can achieve it. Um, and psychoanalysis has a role to play there, I think. All right, looks like we're pretty much at the end of our, uh, uh, our session. Um, I'd like to thank you again, Kathy, for such an engaging presentation and, and um, such wonderful, um, fulsome answers to, to the questions uh, and, and to also to the commentaries. And um, uh, Rogelio and Roberto, thank you again for your, your, your terrific uh, uh, comments on, on the paper. Uh, I'd like to thank those who, who are sticking around to, till the end um, for being here and, and also for your, your questions and comments. Uh, it's been really quite a, a, a wonderful session and uh, quite a fitting tribute to the time that uh, the three of you spent at the Institute uh, last, um, last semester. Uh, and uh, we obviously hope to see you back here again, either virtually or in, in real life. Uh, so thank you very much. And Devin, again, thanks for your, um, for your videography and, and all the work that you do for us. Um, good, well, we'll see you again and uh, we'll be in touch. Um, if you um, want to know more about the Institute and, and uh, you know, the, the work that we're doing, the events that we have, uh, you can sign up to our mailing list on our website. Um, and, uh, you know, all the information is there. We have a Facebook page and, and so on. So you can check that out. All right. Well, have a, have a great evening. And um, thanks very much for being here. Thank Bye, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, Samir, Katie, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Goodbye.